us pray. God, we thank you for this morning, for this time to come together, and we pray that your word would fall fresh on us, that we would hear your message, give us open hearts to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're a Minnesota Vikings football fan, then I don't need to really bring you up to speed about how exciting and interesting the last couple of weeks have been. And if you're not a Minnesota Vikings football fan, we're not going to hold that against you, but I am going to bring you up to speed so you can get a little bit of a recap here. Over the last four or five, maybe six weeks, they've been on a winning streak, and that's been particularly exciting for Minnesota fans after a fairly slow start. But two weeks ago, their head quarterback, their, their starting quarterback, Kirk Cousins, was injured, and he is out for the remainder of the season. And so for last week's game, they brought in their backup quarterback to start, a man by the name of Jaron Hall, and they also traded for an Arizona Cardinals lesser-known quarterback um, by the name of Josh Dobbs. And Dobbs flew in midweek, and they put him through a bunch of medical tests just to make sure that he was fit to play. They handed him a playbook, and they put him on the team flight to Atlanta, Georgia, and they, uh, he was fully expecting to sit on the sidelines for the game. And early into the game last Sunday, Jaron Hall unfortunately was injured early in the game and went out, and Dobbs found himself in the middle of the game, leading the Vikings as the quarterback. And so, of course, Vikings fans had stomachs churning and were kind of bracing for the worst. But what ended up unfolding was this really remarkable game where he was, uh, he, Josh Dobbs himself rushed for more yards than any other player. He made a couple of really incredible um, touchdown passes. And the team had great offense and defense. They really came together. And in the final seconds of the game, they pulled ahead and they won this game. And it was just a really fun thing to watch. If you haven't seen the highlight reel, I encourage you to go out and check it out. And as I was reading some of these articles about this incredible game, one particular article talked about Josh Dobbs' leadership. And they used the word readiness for him. That Certainly it was a team effort, but the fact that he came and he was ready to roll, that he had been working, he'd been traded between several teams over the last couple of years, picking up nuggets along the way, practicing hard in the background of these other teams, doing all the things he needed to, he needed to do so that even though he wasn't expecting to be on the field that day, that he had this really remarkable sense about him, he was ready to roll. For many of us, we look forward to things, and they're things that are on our calendar, things that we're preparing for, making moves in our own lives, so that by the time we get to them, we're, we're ready to roll, whether it's a, a wedding or a test, graduation or something, we, we have a pretty set, fixed date. And we know we want to be prepared for these things. And as believers and God's people, we are called to be prepared for Jesus' return, but of course, we don't have a date on the calendar for that, but still we're called to be prepared and ready for this. And as we continue our sermon series, Living with the End in Mind, we pick up the text in Matthew 25. This is the parable of the ten bridesmaids. This parable is sandwiched between other parables in chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew called the Olivet Discourse. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. He is preparing them for what's to come in their lifetime, which is going to be the fall of Jerusalem and the temple about 40 years later. And he takes it a step further and prepares them and says, just because this is going to happen, this destruction and this suffering, don't expect that, that the Messiah, the Son of Man, of course, Jesus himself, is going to come right after that, right on the heels of that, but there could be this delay. And of course, 2,000 years later, we are living our entire lives into this delay. This is not a surprise to us. Generations before us have only lived their lives in this delay. But there's still a rich word for us in this parable that we need to stay vigilant and keep the faith, that it's imperative for God's people to, in order to be prepared for Jesus' return that we prepare now. So join me as I read the text, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. 
When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went, in, went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's helpful to have a bit of understanding about the wedding customs of this culture in this day. We don't have an entire, entire complete record of what they were, but we can piece things together. That there would have been some sort, of, um, some sort of reception for the bride, some sort of engagement reception at her father's home. And then she would have continued to live in his home for even up to a couple of years. And then at the wedding, that there would have been this kind of day-long celebration at her, the bride's home, and then in, into the evening, into nightfall, the bridegroom would have made his way to the bride's home. She would have been met, probably, or he would have been met in the road by the bridesmaids, and they would have brought the groom to the home of the bride. They would have gathered the bride and then processed together back to the bridegroom's house, and they would have had this wedding banquet there. Probably the entire village would have been invited to this. And the bridesmaids played this critical role, just like bridesmaids today. They would have had these lamps, more like torches, that would have these kind of oil-wrapped rags at the top, and they'd have to continue to switch them out to keep the light burning. And so, in this parable, all things are equal between the bridesmaids, with the exception of the preparedness. The foolish bridesmaids miss the whole point of their critical role when they don't prepare, and they miss out on the celebration at the end. Jesus saying, the bride, Jesus is the bridegroom saying, I do not know you. They miss the celebration altogether. Well, we can't, with parables, look at everything as allegorical. Not everything in the parable stands for something. But we do need to glean the main points that we can learn from them. And what we can take from this is that first, Jesus is the bridegroom. And that his delay, that God may delay his coming longer than people expect. Most importantly, no one knows when Jesus is going to return. Like the wise bridesmaids, those who truly want to follow him must be prepared for such a delay, and this delay might be a challenge for us. And for the foolish bridesmaids, those who are not genuinely following him, there may be an unrecoverable point to undo the damages of a neglected relationship. It's interesting to note, too, that all the ten bridesmaids were expecting to meet the bridegroom. If we think about that in our day-to-day -day lives, all ten were calling themselves Christians, and yet half of them weren't truly following Christ. It's a bit convicting. And certainly we know and expect that Jesus is going to return. This is part of our Christian profession, a huge part of our Christian profession of faith, that God's going to send Jesus, that Jesus will return, and God's going to restore the world to wholeness and justice and righteousness. Some will be included in this celebration and others will not. And that can cause a bit of panic when we first think about that message. But at the same point, we're not called to live into anxiety about this. This is not something God calls us to. We're required to live with urgency, but we're called to live in the peace of God. Jesus says in John 14, 27, Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't, be, don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. So the question becomes, in light of this teaching, how are we to prepare? How do we keep our lamps burning and remain watchful? First, we need to get to know Jesus. The church is called the Bride of Christ in the Bible, and I can't think of a more awkward wedding than somebody who doesn't know the other person walking down the aisle. And yet God says that's, Jesus says it's not even going to happen. So... We're not even going to get to that point. 
We need to ready ourselves by being in relationship with God. These are, this is through the spiritual disciplines. First and foremost, praying, talking to God. Anytime that you enter into prayer, that's the Spirit's invitation to you. He's doing a work in you to say, come and pray with me. He's always praying on our behalf, the Spirit. It's a dialogue we need to be having. We need to read the Bible. Being in Scripture is important, not just because we need to know what Scripture says, but because we meet Jesus there, that we meet God there, that the Spirit does a work in our lives and that he's living and active, working through that scripture. And we need to further explore spiritual disciplines, resting, fasting, disciple-making, spending time in spiritual friendship with other believers, giving, worship, solitude. You can Google Christian spiritual disciplines, and whole lists will come up. Read, reading books about them, we have resources for these things, and certainly would love to walk alongside you if you have questions. Anybody on staff, other pastors, we can certainly... Um, help you with this if this is something you're interested in. But the point isn't to be legalistic about it. The point is to integrate practices that are helpful and meaning to you that help you walk with God in this relationship and trust that he's leading you and that he's actually forming you through it, that he's, he's initiating this relationship with you and you're in it with him. And certainly there's time for quiet time set aside for, for scripture and for prayer. But I would also very much urge you to think through mindfulness, that we can call God to mind throughout our day, that we can be in this constant dialogue with him, understanding that he's always with us and he's always, we can always be calling him and understanding, calling on him and, and understanding that he is walking alongside of us. We think of monks who get into this breath prayer practice where they're breathing in and breathing out scripture and reciting it as a, as a way to continue to contemplate God, to call him to mind. Think of these what would Jesus do bracelets that people were, that were popular in the early 2000s, this little rubber bracelet that would say WWJD. This is the same kind of concept. Like how can I take Jesus, be thinking about Jesus in the everyday moments of my life? Even with my own children, I often say to them, most days going out the door, I love you and God loves you and God's with you because I want them to think through, oh, God's with me at every moment of this day. I can't be with them as their mom, but, but God is there and that's, that's better. God's always with us, so first and foremost, we need to get to know him. The time to do that isn't when Jesus returns. The time to do that is now. Second, we need to commit to a lifestyle as God's people. This is so important that we, that we have this commitment, that it's not something on the back burner of our lives. It's, this is part of our identity, the very fiber of our being. Josh Dobbs, when he stepped on the football field, wasn't just learning how to be a quarterback that day. He had already integrated that into his life. It was a priority for him. Is very evident. I think about celebrating Veterans Day. Those that have served with the military know that when they sign to serve, they're not gonna, it's not going to be a background thing in their life. They're going to go to boot camp, and it's going to be something that's part of their very identity, that they're, they're going to be all in from the get-go. And for us, it's the same as God's people, that we need to be all in now. It's not just something for Sunday mornings or the 30 minutes that we do a devotional. God is calling his church to be on point, on mission for his purposes all the time. It, even when it's gritty. And because no matter what, it's our lifestyle. When Jesus returns, we're going to be prepared. We certainly know when Jesus comes, it's going to be our lifestyle then. And we need to live into kingdom peace here and now. At the very core of our Christian faith is that God is going to fully make things right and redeemed this is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. That the full plan of God is going to be realized when Jesus comes back. This wholeness, this righteousness, this peace. And that's the church's mission, that Jesus' name be spoken and that we are to be bringers of peace into this world. God's peace is the holistic well-being, prosperity, and security that's associated with him among his people. The Hebrew word in the Old Testament for this is shalom. This peace. It's directly associated with the concept of covenant. This is God's presence, his peace, his gift to them. And it was conditional upon Israel's obedience to God. In the prophetic material, the true peace is part of the end time hope of God's salvation. They're pointing to this future peace. And by the time we get to the New Testament text, the, the, the Greek word for this is eirene. 
It's this, this word is of, uh, having understood that it's come from Christ through his life, death, and resurrection, and that we're able to experience it through faith in him. Paul opens and closes his letters with grace and peace. He talks about peace. Jesus teaches about peace. It's all over the text. In our own pietist tradition, this is the, the tradition that our denomination, the covenant denomination, rolls out of, there's something called an irenic spirit. Spirit. It's this peaceable spirit. It comes from the same Greek word, irene. When the forefathers they were shaking out of this 30 years war in the 1600s, there was all this religious war going on. It's Christians pitted against Christians and divisiveness and theological debates and persecution within the government, religious persecution. And the forefathers of pietism believed that this irenic, this peaceable spirit was our role, that we were to, to be able to be bringers of this into the world through the church and that that would permeate through the world. That God would do a work in us when we, when we came into situations, especially situations where there was conflict, that he would bring about healing into the world through, through this peace. And kingdom peace is not passivity. It doesn't mean we're not going to have issues in our lives. It doesn't mean we're not going to be in pressing situations. But that God's end game, his justice and his righteousness and his mercy informing us, are informing us in our everyday lives. But at the end, of the, the end of the age is the starting point of our daily lives and our discussions and our action, interactions and our relationships. As we consider our brothers and our sisters, our neighbors, that we do so with a spirit of peace. Well, in the days, weeks, and months following September 11th, there was a lot of anxiety, of course, in the world, certainly in our nation. Fred Rogers, who is a Presbyterian minister, but better known as Mr. Rogers of the children's television show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, was asked to do a series of videos to address the nation. He is known to have this peaceable spirit. He's a trustworthy person uh, publicly, this public figure. And his very last video was taken a year to the date of the September 11th attacks, just a couple of months before his death. And in this video, he talks about how he often would run into people in their 20s and 30s and 40s, now people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. And they would have this interaction. They would recognize him, and they would inevitably talk for a little bit and hug and part ways. And so this last video, he really addressed that group, though I think it's a message for all of us that speaks to this peaceable spirit. So I'm going to just read an excerpt of that video. He says, I'm just so proud of you all who have grown up with us. And I know how tough it is some days to look with hope and confidence in the months and years ahead. But I'd like to tell you what I often told you when you were much younger. I like you just the way you are. And what's more, I'm so grateful to you for helping the children in your life to know that you'll do everything that you can to keep them safe and to help them express their feelings in ways that will bring healing in many different neighborhoods. It's such a good feeling to know that we're lifelong friends. And when I was preparing, this video just came across my, my feed, and I... I, I wept just listening to his words, just what he's saying that are really sound very simple, but these messages that we incorporate into our everyday lives that we get the privilege to speak into people, things that, are, that, are, that seem very basic, but I'm proud of you. I like you just the way you are, that we would be hosting these discussions where people can share their anxiety, that we would be speaking safety and security into our children's lives and our multi-generational family and friends, that we would be bringers of this peace because we know this future peace that God is bringing about through Jesus and that we get to live into that today. It's not just for the future. We get to be those bringers today of peace in the world in very practical ways that aren't about our judgment, that aren't about our hurt, our, our defensiveness. They're just about being present with people and loving them, being friends with them, being open to having a discussion with them understanding them for who they are, and trusting that God is doing a work of shalom through that. Well, this is the very namesake of our church. Salem comes from the word shalom. It means peace. Well, let's live into our namesake in our lives, in our communities. Let's be people watching and expecting Jesus is returning. People preparing now by knowing God, committing to being his people and bringing kingdom peace into the world with this peace on the forefront of our minds so that when Jesus returns, he says, I prepared a place for you. 
Let's pray. God, we thank you for the hope that you bring through Jesus. We thank you that we get to be a part of that, that bringing that peace into the world, living into that hope. We know that this life is challenging. We know that the delay is hard. It has gritty moments and hard things. So God, we pray for the strength to live into that, to this future promise of peace. Pray that we would be ready, that we would adopt this as our lifestyle, that this be something that is in the, the front and center of our lives that we would honor you by doing so and that you would work through us to be, increased, be, be bringers of peace throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. So grateful.